And I could just speculate on PRL pages. And this is something that you can uh, read in the evening, take a, a beer or a glass of wine and just enjoy it. It's very, um, not technically heavy, but uh, it's kind of telling where, in my opinion, quantum geometry could lead us. So then uh, let's go to the lectures. Uh, it seems like, like lecture one is shorter, but at actually I have more material to it, so we might not uh, finish everything, then we finish in the second lecture, because I'm going to tr go through the basics in a very uh, slow and detailed way. And the second lecture is more like uh, what are all the kind of newest uh, stuff that we have done with this uh, kind of uh, approach. So I start with basics of quantum geometry. This might be uh, uh, trivial to many of you, but um, I think everybody should uh, have this in mind be, uh, to be able to follow my uh, lecture. So uh, geometry means um, here something like uh, uh, why, why, uh, why Helsinki is a very popular uh, airport. Uh, because uh, the uh, Earth, as you know, is round. I hope everybody believes that. So, <laughs> and then if you uh, plan flight routes from one place to another, uh, it might not be that be the best idea to go somehow to straight. You might go towards the pole a bit and then. And this gives you a shorter distance. So you know the distances depend on the geometry of your uh, space where you're working. And uh, one can think also that we have uh, this Hilbert space that we know quantum mechanics and uh, from quantum mechanics, and we want to analyze or characterize distances in our Hilbert space. So then we can define the distance uh, between uh, two uh, quantum states. So this is a very generic quantum state that depends on some parameter k. And now you just change it infinitesimally. And if you calculate this, you should get something like metric for the um, space of uh, quantum states. And yeah, if you uh, then uh, Taylor expand this, by the way, this is a nice exercise. If you uh, miss exercises, uh, do Taylor expansion of this and introduce a cage invariant version for the metric so that uh, it stays the same if you do this cage transformation. Then uh, you end up uh, with uh, what uh, Prost and Valle uh, got that uh, there exists an uh, object uh, which looks like this. It has derivatives of the uh, wave function coming from, you know, Taylor expanding this one. And the real part of this object is a quantum metric. So when you define an infinitesimal distance between two quantum states when you change a parameter, this is the metric that defines how long that distance is. And uh, then the imaginary part is actually very curvature, something that you have uh, heard uh, even too many times, right? So uh, this uh, goes also under other name because these people, Fubini and study, they uh, investigated it already in the beginning of uh, last century in purely mathematical context. But I think in quantum mechanics, it, it became known in this work. And of course, Barry Kovitz, you know how important it is, but this object, quantum metric, has become uh, uh, popular only recently. And uh, now, uh, always in my opinion, if you want to uh, understand something, try to have a two times two uh, matrix example of it. So let's uh, uh, think that our Hilbert space consists only of two states, zero and one then you know that this is the most general uh, parametrization of a state in that space, and uh, it can be visualized in the block sphere very nicely. Now you can take this formula, calculate what is the quantum metric, for instance, for the parameter phi. So you take some derivatives and so on. You end up with psi <coughs> squared. This has a now a very uh, uh, intuitive meaning. So look. When this is zero, you are at the North Pole. Quantum metric is zero. And why? Well, because there your state is just zero, 
And if you now change phi, you don't essentially change the orthogonality of the new state with respect to other to the initial one because um, uh, overall phase doesn't make any difference in quantum state. They are still um, basically para parallel, not orthogonal at all. So that's why the metric is zero for this change. No distance. However, if you are at the equator, like uh, theta equals uh, pi, pi over two, then this is uh, one, it's finite. And yes, you can see at the equator, you have always superposition of one and uh, zero. So if you change phi, you actually do change the state. And the new state can be a little bit orthogonal to the or original one. So it's not more difficult than this. It just tells that uh, if you are somewhere in your space, you change one parameter, do you make the state orthogonal or not, to some extent. And another uh, kind of uh, simple example is this. This is in this from this uh, <coughs> essay that uh, I wrote. So now imagine that you have a lattice system where you can have a, a band structure like this and two orbitals. There you could have some situation where one band is associated with one orbital only and the other one with the other orbital. Now if you change your wave function here a little bit with respect to the block momentum, like this, in this case, they both lie still at the North Pole. So you will have zero quantum metric. However, if you have mixing of the orbitals, so the uh, bands have a mixed character, then when you change a bit from here to here, you could, I mean, this is a bit exaggerated, but you can move uh, from uh, one position on the block sphere to another one. So there is a finite distance now. They become like a little bit non-orthogonal. So your quantum matrix is non-zero. So any questions or oh, crystal clear? Yes, no, now you know what quantum metric is. And uh, yeah, people got uh, interested in only recently. So there are by now only a few realizations <coughs> where people have experimentally measured it. But you can measure it in the same manner that you can uh, measure a Berry curvature. Even in my group, because my group is al also doing experiments in photonic systems, we have uh, measured it. But I will not uh, talk about this uh, today. So <coughs> I uh, presented this in terms of uh, the definition in terms of a wave function, of very general wave function. Uh, when you do theory uh, on quantum geometric superconductivity and so on, it's very useful to look at it in terms of projectors. So here, this is a, in general a projector to a band of interest, or it could be to a projector to several bands, you could have pushed a summation there. Then. And now in this talk, uh, this wave function is always the periodic uh, part of the block function for band n momentum k. And pro projector has nice properties like Hermitian and it's a Square is the same as the protector. And then one, one thing that is kind of nice to think. So, so you think first, of, okay, this has just properties of the band itself. But actually, it has properties of the all other bands because uh, there is a completeness relation. So the protector, you can write it also like this. One unity minus all other bands except yours. So somehow it tells about all the bands. And uh, it's nicely, it's gauge and variant as such, so you, you don't need to worry. And now you can uh, express this quantum uh, geometric tensor with the projector. So that's also another nice exercise, go from this definition um, uh, to this one, just using the projector. And yeah, uh, if you really do, do those tricks, one uh, really nice, uh, I mean, those exercises, one really nice trick is that you take the normalization uh, conditions like u ket, u bra, and equals one, and then you get the derivatives and you get nice relations for those. Okay, but the point is here I have the quantum geometric tensor uh, uh, expressed with the projectors only. 
So this projector is the projector to the band of interest. So you might think, okay, th it tells about the band of interest, but okay, you, you can express it like this. It tells about the properties of all other, other bands. So this quantum metric of one band, or Berry curvature, tells about all the other bands as well. And this is essential. You will see. We, we will talk a lot about multiband processes, and they are all captured by this. OK, some uh, more uh, nice properties uh, that uh, you should be aware. So this quantum geometric tensor, this one, is a positive semi-definite complex matrix. So it means that uh, this is always, I mean, this is general. So now this A is my B. This is always true for any vector. And the real part is the quantum metric. So here you have the definition of quantum metric with projectors. It's just two derivatives. And you can also then, uh, the imaginary part becomes the very connection. And uh, very curvature, sorry, here. And and very uh, connection is this one. So if you actually work out these things, you can connect with this one, or the, or maybe easier with the original definition. Good. So uh, very curvature uh, is, as I said, uh, already very familiar to everybody, and there are like a million of uh, experiments and theory papers about it, so I <laughs> just uh, wrote here some topics. This uh, quantum metric, yeah, it emerged in physics very recently, so up to, uh, let's say, 2019, I was able to list basically the papers, theory papers, where it has been considered significant and our uh, superconductivity work started in 2015 but after that uh, 2019 it has kind of exploded people are now really uh, looking at it so that was um, the basics of quantum geometry we go to superconductivity next unless you have something unclear okay fine and uh, yeah let's uh, uh, yes Why was the real part of the quantum metric um, put by the wayside? Is it not is it experimentally acceptable? No, no. I think people didn't realize that it's useful for something because very curvature, uh, at least in condensed matter physics, the big thing is of course quantum hall and uh, this kind of topology and so on. People just didn't know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter what kind of state it is. Uh, so I, I talked about block states with momentum k, but it can be any uh, quantum state with any parameter that parameterizes it. So it could be some kind of. Yeah, the, the definitions are very, very general. Yeah. Okay, uh, my uh, initial motivation to study these things came came from the fact that I'm annoyed that uh, we are not yet at room temperature. So, uh, so many decades of uh, work, and it's just a factor of two, and we are not st still not there. So there were some ideas uh, that uh, could help. And I started to look at those, and then this geometry kind of emerged. However, uh, yeah, so let's start from a, a, a kind of a, a, a trivial thing to you, the BCS theory. So there the uh, t TC is, a proportion, uh, is exponentially suppressed. As you know, this can be some kind of generic interaction scale and the density of states. And uh, this form comes from the fact that there is a large Fermi level and the poor weak interaction has to compete with that. 
So, so basically, uh, within this framework, you have um, the constituents of superconductivity is that you could change the interactions or you could change the density of states. And the uh, obvious idea is that let's room remove the uh, kinetic en energy so there is no, uh, not this competition or, uh, in other words, maximize the density of states. And then interactions might uh, uh, dominate and you get pairing easier. And this has been uh, uh, looked at. So now, again, here, very simple things. Uh, usual dispersive band with some bandwidth, and this object is very central in my talk. It's the block function, and this periodic part especially is wha what gives you the quantum metric and so on. Then you could have a flat band, and it doesn't need to be exactly flat like here. It could be just uh, that the interaction scale is bigger than the bandwidth, then you're allowed to call it flat band. Now if you do just the BCS theory in this kind of context, uh, you see that here now TC becomes proportional to the interaction uh, uh, energy times the volume of the flat band. A little bit like uh, in uh, Andrei Zhubukov's uh, talk, there was this strong coupling regime where you have TC proportional to the coupling. There is something li like this happens here too. So this sounds good because if you have weak interaction, so this is now not a yeah, in some sense, strong coupling result. I, this can be arbitrarily small here. Uh, but you see that for small interactions, this can give you much higher TC. Sounds very nice and promising. But uh, there is one thing. This is only, uh, uh, the let's say, the absolute value of the uh, order parameter. We only talk about pairing here. And you know that pairing is not enough for superconductivity. You have to have Meissner effect, supercurrent. So uh, supercurrent is a different thing from a, a usual current. As you know, it contains vector potential. And this thing is the superfluid stiffness, or I like to call it superfluid weight. So we have to evaluate that one to say that we have a nice flatband superconductors. And yeah. And uh, it has also a um, mm, clear physical meaning. By the way, oh, as you know, A is not a, a gauge invariant, but neither is your order parameter. You can also make a gauge transformation here. But the combination of order parameter and vector potential are, is gauge invariant. So there is then a nice connection between the phase of uh, the order parameter and its uh, change, which you know describes Cooper pair movement and, and the uh, superfluid weight, meaning that if you put in some uh, supercurrent, your uh, free energy changes by this amount and uh, this uh, superfluid weight appears there. So it's like the inverse effective mass of the Cooper pairs. This is like the kinetic energy of the Cooper pairs. And obviously, it has to be non-zero and positive to have stable system. And yes, superfluid weight also appears in the uh, penetration depth it's in the inverse way. Now, uh, in usual BCS theory, uh, this is the simple uh, uh, formula for superfluid weight. Forget about this, it's uh, usually small in low temperatures. So it's simply this thing very uh, familiar to you, uh, electron charge, density of Cooper pairs divided by effective mass, which you can get from this person, and there you have the problem. This is zero in a flat band. So it sounds like, OK, I had this nice uh, enhancement of pairing temperature, maybe, but the uh, particles won't move. No supercurrent. Right. But this is. Uh, uh, only uh, a single band result. And uh, fortunately, there are interesting uh, flat bands where you have to really look at the problem a bit more carefully. So here, first, uh, uh, I have something like the trivial flat band. You can think that you bind your electrons to the atoms, the atomic limit, and they don't move. And also, then your band structure is flat, very fine. However, there are other types of uh, geometries where you get uh, uh, flat bands from interference. For instance, the Lieb lattice geometry here. It has unit cell of three uh, sides. 
Now you can think that you have a quantum state where the amplitude is plus on these sides and minus on these sides. Now if, if the particles try to uh, tunnel to the A side here, these contributions will interfere. So just due to uh, uh, interference of the wave functions, you will end up with a flat band, and this is the one in the middle. So uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, flat bands, um, in the model systems, you can find them in many, like Kagome lattice also has flat band and the lead lattice and so on, and the story there is uh, kind of explained like this. Then uh, there are uh, like uh, twisted bilayer graphene and other uh, systems where you do it via super lattice. You can think you have a, a lattice, you put a super lattice, new brill one zone, you fold and it becomes flatter and flatter. Uh, actually, these two are the same things, but more in the real space and reciprocal space kind of presented. So it's all interference. And Landau levels as well is a uh, archetypal uh, flat band system, and there also you can think that you have now a big unit cell with uh, some kind of faces uh, at different sides so that you cancel movement by interference. Good. So in this type of uh, flat bands, you have actually have to do a careful multiband analysis when you uh, calculate superfluid weight. And uh, <coughs> this is how we ended up with uh, uh, this quantum geometric results. So uh, I present now like a summary of few uh, bunch of work uh, done with uh, many great collaborators <coughs> from my group and also uh, other groups like uh, Bernevics and uh, Sebastian Hubers. <coughs> and uh, I, I uh, present here this uh, result starting from multiband BCS mean field theory. Uh, the results are more general, but I will come to that. But uh, now just look at this. This is the Hubbard Hamiltonian, assuming that we have some, for some reason some kind of attractive interaction on site. And uh, hopping, so there is a hopping energy scale which can be large. The flatness of the band comes from interference. So hopping actually can be significant. And uh, uh, the multiband nature is here in alpha and beta. So these are my orbitals. I have to keep them expli explicitly there. Then I, I uh, do BCS, kind of self-consistent theory, and induce the supercurrent, then by multiplying the order parameter with some kind of phase factor. And this Q is now Cooper Bell momentum. And then I can get superfluid weight uh, as a second derivative of the ground potential. So this is a known result. But you remember there was this uh, connection between the order parameter phase and the vector potential. So uh, therefore, there is also an un alternative way of getting superfluid weight. You can think about it as a linear response uh, coefficient to, uh, to the vector potential. So you apply vector potential, you get some current, and this, this kernel here gives you superfluid weight at so some limit. And these give uh, the same result, so it uh, provides you a nice sanity check always uh, to calculate it both ways. So we did this to this Hamiltonian. And here is the main result. So we found out that there is uh, what everybody knew, uh, a conven we call it conventional contribution, which is proportional to the dispersion of the band. However, there is another uh, contribution which only exists in a multiband system when you really take into account explicitly the other bands. And it can be non-zero also in a flat band, unlike this one. And moreover, we call it geometric because at certain limits, it becomes simply this, uh, interaction times the quantum metric. So uh, let me uh, show how we get this uh, result. So if we uh, assume this kind of a, a system where your uh, flat band would be isolated 
from other bands. And also uh, the interaction would be smaller than the band gap from the other bands. And furthermore, we uh, assume that uh, a so-called uniform pairing, that whenever there is pairing in some orbital, either yeah, there is pairing or there is not, but when there is, it's the same for all orbitals. So this actually happens when uh, the orbitals are related by symmetry. With these assumptions, uh, we can derive analytical results. The superfluid weight uh, looks like this. It has this linear proportionality to interaction, I exactly like TC. Then the new is filling. So it's maximized at half filling. So it's not like uh, the busiest result that grows kind of with the density, but it's uh, clearly half filling maximized. Number of orbitals here. And this quantity is now the Brillouin zone integrated quantum metric. And uh, yeah, and you have to take the minimal version of this. I will come back to this later, but this mean here is important. And this, um, well, we have uh, derived it with the mean field theory, but you can also get it uh, exactly. So. Uh, Again, with some approximations, you have to, I mean, assumptions about your system, like this kind of limit and so on. But there, you can do get it exactly. So it's not somehow mean field uh, limited result. It's maybe more uh, result limited to certain assumptions about your system. But then uh, there, it's really also you can get it exactly. Now, uh, further uh, in the flat band, you can show that uh, delta becomes uh, this thing. And if you insert this one here, you can see that the superfluid weight is proportional to square of uh, delta divided by u and the quantum geometry part. So, so this, uh, of course, this is just a limit, but it's nice to take some limit and see some analytical result to get intuition. Then you can do the full formula. Uh, uh, numerically, so here we have the full formula. Uh, we don't as, uh, assume isolated flat bands, and this is also finite temperature. So this is what was known. So there are temperature things and, and the dispersion here. And the geometric part uh, looks like this. Again, something from temperature, and then uh, these things. And uh, yeah, and then let's look at this geometric part a bit more, because this form actually tells you something that you couldn't see from the, maybe from the uh, nicest analytical result. So, so I just copy it here. This is the same formula. Now, uh, think again how we get this uh, superfluid weight. So it's a linear response uh, uh, co coefficient. So when you do this uh, linear response calculation, you actually uh, end up having a current-current correlator. And therefore, it's useful to look what is just the current operator. So if you have a, uh, this kind of hopping matrix in your Hamiltonian, uh, in a very generic way, uh, this uh, expectation value of current, which is the derivative of this hopping, contains something that is proportional to your dispersion. So this is coming from the dispersion of the band, group velocity. But it has also these terms. So these are like uh, multiband processes. So M here is some other band than N. So there is this kind of thing here. And look, this, this obviously uh, resembles to these uh, things that we have in the quantum geometric tensor, derivatives of U. And now you can easily imagine that um, if this is current current, you take two current operators, you will end up like having this thing from here, and then the other current gives you this. Wait, yep. How do you statically change group rate matrix with the other one on top? Sorry, how do you? Uh, it's a slight increase in group rate with the density, but with the number one part of the current. Uh, for this one. Uh, I have never thought about it, but I'm sure it, it's there. And, you know, there is a completeness relation uh, 
between all the bands. So I, I'm sure it comes somehow from there. Yeah, yeah, this is great and varied. Yeah, yeah. It's so it should hold. I never thought it explicitly, but I, I'm sure that it uh, comes there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah okay, like 99 percent sure. Yeah, and how I would uh, go for it, I would uh, start from the uh, this completeness relation because these are all these U M and U N are related. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this this has been known for ages. Right. And people have looked at these uh, interband co co um, contributions uh, in many, many places. But the just, just the uh, connection to quantum geometry was not made because people didn't care about this quantum metric. And then in superconductivity, nobody has done this. So, so this is still at one particle level, right? Like what you have done here. Yeah. Yeah, this is all in one particle level. Now, at one particle level, this is known as a anomalous velocity, which is actually proportionally very trivial to the Which is the entropy metric part of the geometric tensor. But your answer turned out, your final answer for the super part turned out to be only proportional to the symmetric part. Yes. But yes. I, I so I want to see where the change occurs. So at one particle level, you should be very sensitive to the to the to the very curvature. Yes. But yes. But your final answer, the very curvature actually disappears. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it may be kind of hand-waving uh, argument why, why, why it is the uh, quantum metric and not the Berry curvature is uh, like that this, this uh, linear response coefficient is really the current, current correlator. So in this anomalous velocity, you look at the current, just the current. And here, it's like current, current. <laughs> it's like noise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Part of the yes, uh, either interactions or you have some nonlinear response, then it also comes. Yeah, but if you have just linear response, no interactions, it's usually very curvature that matters. But then with interactions or nonlinearities, quantum metric comes to play. Yeah. Anyway, did this also uh, kind of reminds you that uh, that. This geometric part it involves some kind of virtual uh, interband processes, yeah. if you wish, and that's why you can get uh, transport of Cooper pairs also in the flat band. All right. So uh, then, uh, I in the beginning, I told you that this quantum geometric ten tensor is um, a positive semi-definite. So this allows me uh, the uh, we make inequalities with the real part, which is the quantum metric, and we have now shown that it's proportional uh, to the, this uh, DS, uh, superfluid weight. So this uh, allows to derive this kind of uh, uh, lower bound of uh, superfluidity in a flat band. So whenever there is ten number, and you have this type of Hamiltonian, more or less, where, where I started from, then you will have uh, superconductivity. And it's also enough if you have just very curvature somewhere in the band and with absolute value. So it doesn't matter if the very curvature kind of cancels. So, so your band could also be topologically trivial, but if you have very curvature or if you have just quantum metric, it's enough. And by the way, this nice result is for time reversal symmetric system. So C is here like the spin chain number, not, uh, not overall. And um, yeah, of course, uh, then if you take, let's say, different type of Hamiltonian, long range, hoppings, interaction, whatever different, uh, we, yeah, we cannot say whether this holds. But uh, within the model I have uh, presented, this is a, a universal lower bound. And uh, also you can derive it exactly. Yep. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, some people, uh, I think, uh, for instance, Jennifer Kano and others, uh, they have done a lot of um, 
research on models where you can make this like a satisfy uh, how to say make this bounds like um how does it complete or wha what's the word now saturate. saturate yes yes yeah so this depends on your model so in some models where we have looked at uh, it's really just it's not saturated but there are other flat band models where you can saturate yeah but you Oh, realistically, oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that uh, it's hard to say, yeah. I mean, there are, of course, I mean, the, the dimensions <laughs> are not the same, so there are some uh, dimensional uh, constant that I have missed. But it's more like a qualitative ar argument that you have to have this non-trivial topology and quantum geometry, and then you can have a uh, transport in flat band for uh, Cooper pairs. So, so basically now the message is that if we want to influence superconductivity and get to a uh, higher uh, TCs, for instance, it's not our uh, constituents are not only that we can manipulate interactions or density of states, we also should look at the Bloch functions. Basically, the quantum geometry matters. You can use it to either have superconductivity or not. So that's a uh, uh, the message. And just to clarify, so this is still a non-trivial bound. It's a bound that you are derived from the material. Yeah, but we can get it also exactly in some models. And it has been uh, proven uh, in some numerical studies. But of course, if you want analytical formulas like this, yeah, to either do uh, uh, this mean field like we did or some uh, exact models, which I will show soon. Yes. So then I, I wanted to understand this, uh, like w w what what's the physics, the intuitive physics behind? And uh, you know, Andrei Zubukov was uh, telling uh, about the Cooper problem and so on. So I thought that okay, maybe we should try to do the Cooper problem here. So so here is what uh, he he took uh, uh, the Schrödinger equation for two particles, so something that you did in your first or second quantum mechanics course and assumed uh, that uh, scattering is limited by the Fermi uh, C. And from that, he got the same TC as uh, uh, from BCS theory up to factors of two and so on. But uh, it's quite amazing that it comes out there. So we, we could try to do this. So here is again this uh, uh, two particles. Schrodinger equation that you can solve without any problems, but the problem here now is that we don't have the Fermi C, so we cannot even start with that. Yeah? So it's just a huge degeneracy. All momenta are at the same energy. When you put particles, they all have the same energy. So what can we do? So, but the idea here is <coughs> that we have to do something else. So I in the, uh, we don't have a Fermi C, we have degeneracy. But if we now introduce interactions between two particles, what happens? Is the pair still also immobile, like the single particles in the flat band, or does it get a finite mass, which would allow it to move? So this is like we are uh, looking at an instability towards having a finite effective mass for a pair in a system where single particles strictly have infinite in effective mass. So this is the uh, binding energy that uh, one gets. And by the way, in a flat band, you always have pairing for any interaction independent of the dimensions. So that's different from dispersive uh, systems. And here uh, is the interaction strength. Uh, this V of X tells uh, what is the interaction in different orbitals. X is the orbital. Uh, uh, coordinate here. And here we have our friend, uh, the periodic bug of Bloch function that you have seen already many times. Q is the momentum of the pair. So there seems to be kind of a, like a non-trivial maybe dependence on the Q. And now you can uh, uh, expand this, again Taylor expansion, which you can do if you want to, an exercise. And we also assume, as uh, in many of our <laughs> things, that we have this uniform pairing, that the pair, uh, interaction is the same in all orbitals where we get pairing. 
And with these assumptions, we get the same result as from the multiband BCS. Namely, that the uh, inverse effective mass of the pair is this. It contains the quantum metric. And I mean, this uh, superfluid weight is uh, basically the inverse uh, effective mass. So just like in the Cooper problem, Cooper got from two-body problem the same result as BCS theory gives. Also here, we get from the two-body problem in a flat band the same result as the multiband BCS theory. So th this is quite nice. And it also gives you at least one kind of intuitive handle to <coughs> this that, OK, when you form a pair, even just a single pair, just two particles, a single pair, this pair will have a finite effective mass, even when the single particles had. Good. All right. Uh, so then maybe uh, uh, let's look at the intuitive picture from a different point of view. Forget about the pair and so on. Uh, just think that we, we have here um, what I told uh, the uh, trivial flat band, the atomic limit, where you just uh, really localize your uh, one near functions very tightly uh, to the atomic sites, and there is no significant overlap. Now, if you would then add interactions to this, uh, nothing much happens. But in these flat bands that we are interested in, you can actually have a uh, quite uh, widely spread one year functions which have overlap, but nevertheless you have flat band due to the interference effects. And then with uh, interactions, apparently, yeah, this interference is kind of um, disturbed if you wish to think like this. But anyway, this overlap allows then movement of pairs. And why is it com uh, connected to topology and so on? and quantum geometry. Uh, here you, you can um, then co connect to previous literature because it has been known for a long time uh, that if you have, a, for instance, a topological band, then you cannot have an exponentially localized uh, one year function. So it's about the localization properties of one year functions. So quantum geometry tells about that. And for us to have really a transport of Cooper pairs, we need to have these overlaps. We cannot have perfect localization. Right. OK, so uh, so far I s showed you kind of a mean field uh, uh, results. Uh, but uh, th there are many groups ha who have done also uh, uh, numerical approaches, like very, very well beyond mean field. And for instance, this kind of uh, linear dependence of the superfluid weight with uh, uh, interactions. This has been shown also uh, numerically. And then, uh, yes, then I'm going to the exact results. So <coughs> in this paper, we showed uh, that uh, you can actually do perturbation theory. Now this is for uh, you have superconductivity. How do you do perturbation theory? Well. Um, you can do it again if you uh, assume this isolated flat band. Because then you can think that your interaction is smaller than the band gap, and you do perturbation with that. And if you do that, you can show that the effective Hamiltonian in the flat band becomes of this form. So these are now flat band operators. That's what, uh, what this uh, bar here is. And it's just. The, the densities of different spins, and this is positive semi-definite Hamiltonian. That's very nice. So we have another work where we utilize that. And here uh, comes the projector that I uh, was teaching you in the beginning. So a reminder here. And now we allow multiple flat bands. So it's a project to the many bands. And uh, then uh, we do a projection to the flat band using the projector like this. So these are flat band operators now. And uh, then we assume again this uniform pairing condition, meaning that the pairing is the same in all orbitals, where it's non-zero. And with the projector, you can actually uh, express it like this. Uh, so the, this is the number of flat bands, orbitals, and unit cells. And we use uh, this uh, thing that the projected Hamiltonian is positive semi-definite. Then we can show exactly that there is a ground state which uh, is formed of et eta pairs. 
this kind of pairs that are now like Cooper pairs, but they contain all momenta. It's like a superposition of all momenta. So this is an exact ground state. You know, because uh, uh, we can show that the energy is zero, and this is positive, so definite. So it's clearly ground state. Then, very nicely, uh, one can show that here the excitations of this Hamiltonian in the flat band are governed by essentially single particle Hamiltonian, which look like this. It's made of these projectors. And it's a single particle Hamiltonian, so you can uh, solve it exactly. So we get all the excitations of this many particle model exactly. And from here, we get, for instance, the Cooper per effective mass, and it's this thing U, the interaction, times the minimal quantum metric, which we got from multiband BCS theory, mean field theory, from the two body problem, and from this exact approach. Th that, that's quite nice. And then uh, some other Leggett and Goldstone modes and so on. They, they are here. And uh, I have talked so many times about this uniform pairing condition that I now have to say that, uh, or emphasize, that, uh, well, actually, in the beginning, we thought that, OK, let's just assume it. And uh, hopefully, it's true. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, there are some systems. Uh, you can always assume uh, something that's true. But hopefully, there are many systems where it's valid. And actually, uh, there are, because now we have shown, uh, together with Bernevik's group, that uh, it, uh, it always uh, happens if the orbitals are related by the symmetry of the system. And, and this is true in many materials. Not all, of course, not all. So, so these results kind of uh, yeah, would apply to real materials then. Good. So but uh, the thing that uh, we have also assume, uh, assumed always, this um, uh, isolate, uh, isolated flat band, that's uh, just for the theorist's convenience. Uh, yeah, it's very hard to do something analytical without that assumption, but I would really like to be able to do it because actually uh, concerning TC, for instance, it's better often to have band touchings. So here we have an example of the Lieb lattice where we uh, calculate the superfluid weight and from there that we get the PKT temperature in 2D. So here as a function of the interaction. And this is in scale of the hopping, by the way. Uh, now, uh, in Lieb lattice, you can modify it a bit and uh, open a gap here. Here you have a Dirac point, but you can open a gap between the flat band and other bands. And if you have a gap like this, you see TC is smaller. And when you have the Dirac point touching, it's the best TC. So it would be very nice to do also a kind of more analytical theory for that case, but we haven't been successful yet. But just as a message, the isolated flat band uh, assumption is just for theory convenience. But if you really want to go to high TC, it's not good to get a lot of bands here. And <coughs> you can understand it um, because um, if you have a band gap, the quantum metric becomes the bigger, the closer you bring the other band. So also in the isolated flat band result is nice. Yeah, it's proportional to quantum metric that becomes bigger. But then your theory is valid in a smaller and smaller interval because u has to be smaller than the gap. And then when they touch, uh, you cannot define quantum metric anymore and very curvature, as you know, with band touchings. So yeah, then, yes? No, I think there is no knowledge on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just assume that, uh, like, let's say, if we assume that BKT physics is there, then we get this critical temperature. But I think that's uh, one thing that people should really study, whether this vortex, vortex physics remains the same. Yeah?
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we. Yeah, because we really get a kind of a continuous order parameter which has a unified phase. And uh, vortices are about the, the phase. Of yes, yes. So I, I also believe that it, it's pretty much there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you start to create like what I would call on-site pairs. Maybe that's your vocabulary, but yeah. Yeah, you really mix all these bands. You see uh, if your interaction is five and this whole bandwidth of all bands is four, of course you mix all of them. So then you can create some kind of localized pairs. So it's like this BCS, B BC lim crossover. So No, no, no. And all these results uh, on the bounds and so on, they are for the isolated right. flat bands where U is smaller than your band cap. Right. So you cannot uh, apply at all. Yeah. And this uh, uh, figure uh, contains another important message, except that the band touchings are good. Uh, it's this thing. There is this black line, and this is just a square lattice. Nothing. Uh, no, no quantum geometry, nothing. And uh, you see, when you go to large interactions, it gives much higher TC. So the advantage of uh, flat bands for superconductivity comes when uh, your interaction is small compared to your hopping. Like here, then you see, you see it, uh, this is an insert is from here. It's like exponentially better. So this is good for small interactions compared to hopping elements. But for large ones, you may be better with a completely conventional dispersive band. The same we saw in a Haldane-Hubbard model where you can have uh, approximately flat bands that, uh, that uh, there we can also go to dispersive and flat bands. So in flat bands, it's like this, okay, this is simple BCS result, and then the BKT from uh, superfluid stiffness, it's like this. And here in this uh, lower corner, yeah, indeed, the flat band is so much better than the dispersive band. But over here for large interactions, again, the dispersive band is better. <coughs> yep. OK. Yes. So I I in my uh, essay, I uh, tried to coin this kind of a sentence that the devil is in the supplementary. I guess I have noticed this is always the case. <laughs> so uh, now. Uh, here are the mean field results that uh, started all this business. You see, here is the uh, superfluid data. So now, was somebody observant? Was it wha what is missing here? What's different from the result that I showed as the correct result? <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's very subtle. But I will show you what is the difference. But uh, uh, I saw here what is uh, uh, the problem, which we kind of knew, but we always just shrugged our shoulders well, yeah? <laughs> and uh, many people probably didn't think. Namely, uh, now we are always looking at um, um, multiband models where you have uh, several orbitals in unit cell. And in some, let's say, lattice model, you can have them at certain physical positions. And you think this is kind of trivial that you can you could, could just change the position if you keep these hoppings here, connectivity is the same. And indeed, uh, for superfluid weight, it doesn't matter if you move the positions of these orbitals. However, this uh, quantum geometric quantities, very curvature and quantum metric, they depend on orbital positions. So they are gates invariant, but they are not, so to speak, basis uh, invariant. Like if you change, put this B a bit here and see, but maybe keep it all 
put it somewhere else, your quantum metric changes. So now we have something basis independent and something basis dependent, terrible. Yes, so uh, it took many years for us and others to uh, understand this. And the only difference between this and this here is that this is actually the minimal quantum metric. So this is the right result, which, which is given here. Accidentally, I mean, this is also correct in many systems, mm -hmm. we uh, learn. But let's go to see what, what is the problem at the level of equations. So <coughs> uh, I mentioned that uh, you can get superfluid weight from the uh, second derivative of the uh, uh, grand potential. And it's really the full derivative. Now, uh, we used an approximation, and everybody else also used, that it's the same th as the partial derivative. Uh, because uh, in if you have time reversal symmetry, you have this uh, relation. And this immediately tells you that at uh, q equals 0, uh, uh, delta is real. And then if q is non-zero, the real parts are the same, but the imaginary parts can be different. And now uh, our argument in the supplementary, just one line in the supplementary, is that you can always gauge away those uh, imaginary um, faces and so on. But actually, uh, if you write this, it's this thing plus something that is uh, related to the imaginary parts uh, of, of the order parameter at finite q, because now you have to calculate how does omega change because your imaginary part of delta change when you go have the vector potential. And uh, we thought that this can be all neglected by, uh, by some kind of transformation. But if you do that transformation, yeah, you can put this away, but then this changes. So that's not good. And this one gives you the quantum metric result. So first we were worried that, oh, maybe the quantum metric result is not there at all. However, it turns out that you can uh, show that uh, uh, actually the minimal possible quantum metric is the one uh, that is uh, connected to the uh, superfluid weight. And since it's minimal, it's unique. It's the, like, let's say you change the orbital position, you find the minimal value, that's it. So that's orbital independent. And uh, uh <coughs> now don't think you have to start to minimize something because we also showed that if the orbitals are at high symmetry positions, then actually your quantum metric is automatically minimal. Yep. So the thing that we're minimizing over the parameters are the positions of the orbitals. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And here I think this is a good point to stop then after this, but I want to show here an example. This is the Lieb lattice uh, where you can um, uh, change the orbital positions, like here. And you can also change the connectivity uh, with some kind of delta. So when delta is one, you actually have isolated unit cells. So obviously you can have superfluidity there. And, and then for these different cases, now if you uh, calculate for different uh, orbital positions, the quantum metric, you get all kind of results. These blue ones are the quantum metric results for without minimizing. And then uh, if you really calculate the complete result, it's this red line. So you have superfluid weight, you have superfluid weight. Here in the disconnected one, it's zero. But the quantum metric at certain uh, wrong position would give you uh, a finite value for superfluid weight. So it can even go qualitatively completely wrong. And here you see um, the symmetric uh, position, it's this when uh, I think it's A equals half. Yeah, so, so it coincides, in the case of delta equals zero, it coincides with the right result. And that's why our uh, Lieb uh, paper <laughs> happens to be completely correct, even if we didn't know about this, because in the Lieb, usual Lieb lattice, you automatically get the writing without these corrections. I mean, <coughs> these, these corrections should be there, then if you don't have uh, orbitals in symmetry positions. So I guess that's enough for today and we continue tomorrow. <laughs>